Jesus, good shepherd of the sheep, by whom the lost are sought and guided into the fold, feed us and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be whole. And lead us that we may be with you, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. If, if you would please rise and join me in the call to worship. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Lord is risen Blessing and honor is yours, O God. Glory to God forever. Alleluia. O come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us pray. God is present to guide our journey and eager to forgive us when we go astray. Therefore, in humility and faith, let us confess our sins against God and neighbor. Holy God, we confess that we have strayed from your paths of right relationship and peace, and we have dishonored you, ourselves, and your creation. We repent of these hurtful ways Forgive us, we pray, as we learn to forgive others and guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. God's mercy overflows as a healing spring to cleanse us of our offenses. Therefore, know that you are forgiven and receive new life in Christ. Nothing 
to say they just lost their dearest friend all that he said now he was dead so this was the way it would end the dreams they had dreamed were not what they'd seen now that he was dead and gone the garden the jail the hammer the nail how could a night be so scripture readings this morning come from the book of Psalms, Psalm 23, and from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Uh, with our responsive psalm reading, you can uh, certainly follow along on page 458 of your Pew Bible, or you can turn to the insert in your bulletin. Uh, as many of you know, the psalms are composed in such a way that it encourages uh, the people of God and the people of faith to sing these words. And the words of Psalm 23 have been set to music many, many times, and you will find such a setting in your bulletin insert, and Angie will uh, lead us through how we are going to responsively read and sing this beautiful psalm. For shepherd me, O God, I will give an introduction, and then I will sing through the refrain one time, and then I encourage you all to sing the refrain another time with me. 
Then the pastor will be um, saying the odd number verses, and then the congregation speaks the even number verses. Where it says refrain, we will go into singing the refrain as part of our reading. shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, Beyond my fears, from death into life. And our New Testament reading from the book of Acts can be found on page 918. Listen again for God's word. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. This is the word of God. There are some things in our world, even today, that are pretty amazing and unbelievable. Things described in this way, they still happen, and quite frequently. Take the case of Angel the Coyote. Angel, this past week, is reported to have given birth to a healthy litter of five coyote pups. Amazing, right? Well, what if I told you that Angel did so after a grueling five-week journey crisscrossing the Santa Ynez Valley in California, most of that time starving and trying to evade predators that were trying to kill her? What if I told you that all during that five-week journey of starvation and danger, she was traveling while blind? What if I told you the reason that this coyote mother was blind 
was that she had been shot right between the eyes and still has a bullet lodged in her brain, a bullet that should have ended not only her life, but the five pups that she carried. It's amazing. It's shocking. It's unbelievable. Things like this don't happen. They're not supposed to happen. As I read the story of this amazing situation earlier this week, it really stuck out to me. It really stayed with me. The story with its themes of determination, of defying all the odds, even the outright fact that this just shouldn't be. Things like this don't happen. But in life, even with something that that is, that's that amazing, that is that miraculous, we pay attention to it for about two or three minutes. And then we explain it away, we reason it away. More often than not, we just outright ignore things like this happening. Stories about things that shouldn't be. Well, in our rational world, in our logic, in our day-to-day -day life, these things just don't happen. They can't happen, so we just choose to not believe in them and then wonder why we have such trouble seeing God in the world when God is doing things just like this. Yet among the ordinary, the extraordinary still happens. The God who created this world, the God who raised Jesus from the dead is still active, still involved in our world. Even in things as simple and as innocuous as a coyote mother giving birth to pups. In our readings today, both explicitly and implicitly, they talk about shepherds fitting on a day that we call Good Shepherd Sunday. Shepherds are many things in the ancient world, but especially shepherds were the ordinary. They were the average Joes of the world. They were the ones that were always there, seemingly always there, everywhere, but in the background. Nobody really paid attention. No one really noticed that they were there. No one really paid attention to them. That's why a former king of Israel wasn't really thought of to be much of anything, at least when David was only known to be a little shepherd boy. At the time of Jesus' birth, it wasn't only to wise men from the east that the angel announced the coming of our Lord and Messiah, but also to shepherds in the fields, the ones that were among the first ones told to go and spread the good news of what happened in Bethlehem that day. Even today, people take the mantle and they shepherd us, they guide us, they lead us, and they do so in ways that we often discount and ignore. Now, we may not call them shepherds per se, but through their actions, that is exactly what they do for us. In many ways, that's what's going on in our reading of Acts. We see a shepherd in Peter, Peter who travels now from Jerusalem to the northern parts of Israel and out towards the coast, not far from modern Tel Aviv. He's in the trade city of Lydda. And in our readings, he travels to Joppa, another city on the Mediterranean shore, one about nine miles away. In Lydda, this shepherd, this one who would lead and guide the early church, just like the shepherd described in the 23rd Psalm would do, he heals a paralyzed man named Aeneas. And after this we read, he is summoned to Joppa and he prays over the body of a woman named Tabitha. In fact, he prays her back to life. For Peter, faith is not about what you believe. Faith is about what you do. It's about what you are willing to do, what you are willing to put your life on hold for so that you can follow the leading of God. It's about, it is about what you are willing to put your life on the line for. It's a faith that sustains, a faith that provides and protects for the shepherd as well as those being shepherded. And that's good for Peter because Peter is about to embark on a mission much harder than he's had thus far much harder than the time when he traveled with Jesus, much harder than going to these early churches with Jewish converts. For in chapter 11, the very next chapter, the very next verses, in fact, Peter will travel to a Roman official named Cornelius. 
because Peter will be the first one charged with carrying this message of Jesus to the Gentiles, and he will need such a faith as this to sustain him in that work. But Peter is not the only shepherd that appears in our reading. Tabitha, or Dorcas, her name means gazelle. Now, of all the animals you could possibly shepherd, gazelle really isn't one that immediately comes to mind. But that is her name. Her title, though, is disciple. In fact, Tabitha is the only woman in the entire New Testament to have the title of disciple. There are lots of females in the New Testament. There are lots of female leaders, lots of female deacons, in fact, in the New Testament, but only one that is called disciple, and this is she. Now, I once heard the term disciple defined as a lifelong learner and follower of Jesus Christ, a lifelong learner and imitator, rather, of Jesus Christ. And that's a very good description of what a disciple is, one who learns all they can about Jesus so that they can then act like Jesus. How did this woman learn of Jesus? We're not really told, but we see in this description how she imitated her Lord and Savior. It's almost as if she heard the words of Matthew 25, those words that said, when I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. Clothing, that was her ministry. Yes, it was a ministry of caring and provision, but it was particularly a ministry clothing. She made clothes, both the inner and outer garments that made up the common dress for women in those days. But she wasn't a high-end fashion designer. She was no Vera Wang making the latest fashions for the rich and the famous. Now the clothes that she made were for those who could never pay her back. The clothes she made were ones that were designed to be given away to the poor, to the powerless, to the widows in Joppa. Now, as widows, they would have been among the poorest and the most vulnerable people in Joppa. These were the people she was called to serve. And it was through the works of her hands, literally the work of her hands, taking needle and fabric and sewing that together, that she ministered to these people. And because of that, these women who had absolutely nothing had the clothing that they needed. Tabitha like many Christians even today, realize that in faith we are family, and family takes care of family. Therefore, we understand that the loss that these widows felt, it was not just the loss of one that they knew, not just one that they loved and cared about. This was one who was an essential provider for them, those who were forgotten, those who were always pushed aside. In many ways, Tabitha was the one that kept them going. So all they can do in their grief is reach out for Peter, who they have heard is just a few miles away, a few cities over. And when he comes, all they can show him about this woman is literally the clothes that they wear, the clothes that Tabitha meant. They show Peter not with their words, but with their very clothes, what Tabitha meant to them, who she was, what she did. In many ways, Tabitha was a shepherd to these women, protecting them from the elements as much as she protected them from the public shame and ridicule that often came with being a widow. She was the one who would think of herself second because she was always thinking of other people first, putting their needs, the needs she could meet, ahead of her own. Do we look that way? Do we think of ourselves second, looking always for a way we can serve, a way we can open our arms, a way we can open our lives to help other people? Will we be remembered that way? Will people literally be able to show this is what this person meant to me, one who gave everything of themselves for us? Now, if we are with this reading up to this point, if we don't see anything all that extraordinary up to this point, where most of us lose it, where we say, oh, isn't that a nice story, but that, that sort of stuff doesn't happen today, where all of, the, all of this seems to fall apart is what happens next, because being summoned, Peter arrives, he is immediately taken to the body that has been lovingly prepared for burial by these widows, and after ordering all of them out, he kneels down, 
And he goes to the true source of his strength and guidance, the true source of guidance and strength of any shepherd, and he prays. And as he prays, here's the catch. She returns to life. That doesn't happen. Dead people don't come back to life. As he prays, Peter remembers his Lord and Savior. He remembers the good shepherd. He remembers what Jesus did with Jairus' daughter when he heard that she had died. And this Roman official comes and asks Jesus to do something. And he comes and he says, little girl, get up. And she got up. Or maybe he remembers the prophet Elisha and how he raised the Shunammite's son when he had died. Or Elisha's mentor, Elijah, and how he raised the widow's son to life. God is still active. God is still involved. God is still here if we're, not, if we're willing to not immediately discount the miraculous, even when it occurs with ordinary people in ordinary ways. The text tells us because of this, because of what Peter did, because this woman lived and could continue her ministry, many believed, but do we believe? We with our reason, with our logic, with our understanding of the way things ought to be, do we believe a story like this? When it comes to shepherds, there really is no better description in the Bible of what a shepherd is and what a shepherd does than the 23rd Psalm. But I think we could call the 23rd Psalm the 23rd Deception because it is deceptively easy to misunderstand these words. It's a deception because it has a power that we often just completely overlook, one we don't even notice. We know the words. In fact, many of us have probably memorized part or all of the 23rd Psalm. Many of us have heard it. We read it together today. We hear it at funerals. We go to it when we're in need of assurance that God is with us. The words that can be sung, words that can be recited, words that can be read, words that we can keep in our heart. It's familiar. It's comforting. It's something we know. And because we know it, we think we know all there is to know about it, right? We can control it. But when we take a moment and we think about the shepherd that is described in the words of the 23rd Psalm, that shepherd is none other than God. And God is anything but controllable, anything but docile and predictable. Think of the most often thought of image of a shepherd, the one accessory that a shepherd must have. It's a shepherd's crook, that, that big upside down J staff that they carry with them. And we know what that is, right? Well, that's what the shepherd goes out. And when the sheep or the lambs start to go this way and that way, in fact, when they start to go in places they shouldn't, the shepherd reaches out that crook and guides them gently and lovingly back to where they need to be. Because that's what a crook is for, right? That's all the crook is for. Well, maybe it's the staff that that shepherd will lean on if it gets a little rough or rocky. Maybe they can use that as a stick to help them a little bit, but that's, that's all it really is. We forget just as often as that shepherd uses that hook end of the crook to bring those wayward lambs and sheep back, also uses the other end, the butt end of that, to poke them and to prod them because sheep don't want to go where the shepherd knows they need to go. When they're not willing to go on their own, they need a little nudge, a little push, a little, hey, get going. And God does that with us too. In fact, anyone who acts as a shepherd to us, that's what they do. They poke us and they prod us. They make us a little uncomfortable. More than that, that crook taken as a whole, that long staff with its weight, with its heft, in the arms and in the hands of an experienced and seasoned shepherd, it's a pretty mighty weapon, actually provides great defense for those that come under the provision. Now, if you spend time among sheep and among shepherds, ones that use crooks, you notice after a while they start to reach out because they want to feel that crook. Because even if they can't see the shepherd behind them, that crook, they know, oh, they still have their eye on me. 
Someone is still watching out for me. Someone is leading me in the right ways beside, through green pastures beside still waters. Someone is still there when those wolves come to tear me apart, to drive them away with that. It reminds them that if they are the one, that that shepherd will leave the 99 to come find them. So who are our shepherds? Now, yes, we can all say, we can all cop out the easy answer, well, God is our shepherd. In fact, God is the good shepherd. That is how Jesus describes both himself and his Father in heaven in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I am the one that call you by name. You are the one that know me when I call, and I know you. But that is not all. God has always sent and has always used those who are willing to be shepherds. Now, we might call a shepherd a disciple, like Tabitha. We might call them an apostle, like Peter. Nowadays, we may call them teacher, lawyer, parent, brother, friend. The names really are endless, but they all go back to those ones that are looking out for us, the ones that are guiding us, the ones that are pointing, not that way, this way. Come back. Be safe. We know shepherds not by their names. We know shepherds by what they do. And today, we are called to give them honor and recognition and thanks. We are called to listen and to follow. In the end, though, it is so much simpler to ignore, to discount, to explain away, especially in simple ways like this. But God will have none of that. Listen for the voice of the shepherds in your life. Ask God for the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the heart to know a shepherd when you are in their presence and to realize when we listen for their voice, when we listen for their leading, when we follow their guidance, really we are sensing and hearing the voice of the good shepherd speaking through them and speaking through their actions. The one of the 23rd Psalm, that good shepherd of John chapter 10, the one who knows each and every one of us, the details of each and every one of our lives, and calls us, calls us by name, and says, I know you. And because I know you, you know me. But with all things, we must always ask, will we answer that voice when it calls? As we come now to our time of prayer, uh, we want to continue praying for uh, Pastor Ray Rady's cousin, Doug, uh, who was burned uh, very severely in a gas line explosion a little over a week ago, uh, has uh, very severe burns on about 70% of his body, uh, will be in the hospital for about the next three to four months as he recovers, but is in uh, good spirits and is surrounded by prayer, including ours. So we want to continue to pray for him. Um, also want to continue praying for Harley Petrie. Uh, one of the joys of uh, coming to a concert, uh, at least for me, is that I don't have to be up here. I can be out there, or in the case of last night, um, up in the balcony, which is awesome and comfortable. Um, but I also had the privilege uh, and the joy to see Carol and Harley, uh, who did come down for the concert last night. It was good to see Harley up and about. And in fact, except for that walker, you almost wouldn't know that he had major heart surgery. But uh, he will begin his recovery and his rehab for, from his uh, quintuple bypass on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. So uh, still has a very long road to go, but uh, it was very good to see him. And I want to continue praying for him and his recovery. Uh, we also want to pray for uh, Rosemary Tate's uncle, Jim Cook, uh, who was taken to the hospital earlier this week after accidentally ingesting uh, his wife's medication. So we want to pray for his ongoing recovery as well. Are there other needs and concerns or joys and blessings we would share at this time? Yes, Sue. Um, Rick Rose promised birthday for the season. Absolutely. In the midst of planting season, uh, for safety as the farmers are out in the fields uh, planting the food that very much sustains our world. Yes, Judy.
very difficult times for uh, the Lancaster family, especially for the family of Jim and Bill, uh, as they have many health concerns. Seeing and hearing no others, and with these on our hearts and minds, let us return again to God in prayer. In this season of Easter rejoicing, let us offer our prayers and thanksgiving, saying, O risen Christ, open our eyes to the mercy, in the, to your mercy in the world. We pray for the goodness of the earth, that it may flourish with flowing waters, verdant pastures, and paths that lead us to protect and care for your creation. For the peace and welfare of the world, that all our tables of work and worship would promote the understanding and dignity of others that transform enemies into friends. We pray for all who suffer with sickness, need, or danger, that all our afflictions and fears would be met with healing and the comforting presence of your voice. For the blessings that we receive and those that we share, that we may live a life of ceaseless praise for the salvation that is ours through you. For the saints in light, that you will wipe every tear from their eyes as they dwell with you eternally. O risen Christ, open our eyes to your mercy in this world. Holy God, you are our hope and our strength, our light and our sovereign, our shepherd and our savior. With all the saints in heaven and on earth, we praise your holy name and entrust every care to you through Jesus Christ, who we pray now as he taught we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Go forth to follow paths of righteousness. Go forth to follow paths of peace. And may God's goodness and mercy follow you as you serve the risen Lord. May Christ the Good Shepherd bless and guide you this day and always. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.